This week's episode is sponsored by Hair Replacement Glasgow, men's non-surgical hair replacement. For exceptional value, they use only the best ultra-realistic, non-invasive men's hair systems. You can wash it, style it, play football, go to the gym and even swim with confidence. So if you are looking for an instant transformation with 100% human hair styled exactly the way you want it, then contact Hair Replacement Glasgow for your free consultation. 1987, or 12 hours, 1987, there was a robbery committed from Sun and Sorton of us. It happened to be Britain's biggest post office robbery, three quarters of a million pounds was stolen. The police went to me mum's looking for me, me and my brother John. I wasn't there, they arrested my brother John. On an identity, identity period, when a police woman came forward and said, that is not the man, but he really resembles him. That was a woman who was going to pick me out and verbal me out and fit us up. Lo and behold, the geezer got his eye put out. I got arrested, high speed chase from Newcastle City Centre. So I'll never get. I got the suitcase. And when I, I clicked it like that, I see them on the telly and they want to raise it forward. What the fuck? It was full, full of money, it was a million pounds in it. So I spent a year in the run at the time, it was, you know, it was a big thing. You know, in the 80s, if you got to go and leave the country, you know, to take the trip abroad, as you would say, you know, you only ever heard it on the TV, and that's what I had to do, you know. Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Newcastle, Stephen Sayers. How are we, brother? I'm all right, how's yourself, lad? Mate, I'll try and reach you over and shake your hand. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you. Aye. Um, the book, Tried and Tested at the Highest Level, wrote by our very own man, mm -hmm. Steve Rafe. Great book. Yeah. Very yeah. interesting. The family's got the reputation of the toughest family in Newcastle, which is a big reputation to have. We spent a lot of time in prison. We've lost a lot of family members to murder. It's a story that you've not really told very often, so... It's good to have you here to eventually tell it and we'll go right back to the start, Stephen, how it began and where you grew up. Well, I grew up in the West End of Newcastle, in Elswick. Um my dad was my dad my dad was a barber boy. A variety of different occupations. Criminal come to mind. My mum was a civil servant. There was four brothers, one died at birth, God love him. Um I had a stepsister as well, she passed away just recently. Um me and my two brothers. I suppose that's where the reputation come from, you know. Your dad had a fearsome reputation about the Newcastle area. How was your upbringing with your father? Well, my dad, when I remember, my dad lived a double life, you know. He lived at my mum's house. He lived with us three days a week, and he lived with another family four days a week, you know. Which was very, wasn't very nice. It wasn't very nice. He worked in the, um, at the time. I remember as a young lad, he had a variety of different occupations: scrapyard, barrow boy. Haulage sticks to mind because he had a haulage company and he worked for the breweries at the time. He had about eight, eight wagons or something working for the breweries. There was custom them days. When you delivered your drink, you got a bottle of beer for note. So uh, over a course of a day, you know, my man might knock 12 bottles of brew nail on them. <laughs> yeah, was it doesn't get called wife beat off or nothing. <laughs> Fuck's sake. Right. So 15, you, was your first prison sentence? Was yes, it Boston? Detention? No, detention centre. Mm -hmm. I went to a nightclub, I went to a nightclub, the, inf the infamous La Dolce Vita. I was 14 years of age. I came out of there, was a big mass brawl outside. We left there, we got into a vehicle. Stumbled across the people again. There was a big, f there was a commotion in the street, you know, like so them had tools, the lads, we got tools at the car. Pop my foot into it, you know. Um, lo, and lo and behold, the geezer got his eye put out. We got arrested, high speed chase from Newcastle City Centre. Uh, one of the lads got two years, one of the lads got Boston, and obviously received a sentence of detention centre, you know, three months. I was 15 years of age, I came out of there when I was 16. From there, prior to that, I'd been a barry boy. I'd worked with my dad's scrapyard and I'd been a barry boy, which I loved. I worked with all different members of my family, that was from an early age of like, say, a six. You know, the barriers were illegal, the barriers were fruit barriers working in Newcastle City Centre. And you had to have a licence to work, you know, but unfortunately we never had one. So the all the family, my great grand had nine nine lassies, one laddie. Every one of them offspring worked on the barrows, so did their children. My dad had forty cousins, forty full cousins on his mother's side. All one somewhere along the line they all worked the fruit barrows. And as I say it was illegal so you would get arrested and the stuff taken off you. Now me and my young cousins, we would stand on lampposts looking for police officers come down the road at six years of age. You know, them days if you took the, if you took the hobs off the scales off the barrow, 
they, you could get a buy because you could see I'm transporting the stuff on the barrel to the shop or to where it was going. They knew different, but and that was basically that was my job, you know. Um, as I say, I got detention centre. I came out. The barrel's become legal. Uh, I applied for the pitch. I got refused, you know, with a conviction. Uh, to, I suppose my life went into crime from then. I suppose my likes of the likes of Stephen. If even Stephen began, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you're working from the ages of six, kind of involved in basically crime then, or trying to, aye, 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 try aye, to aye. get an earner, and then 15 detention centre. Is that when you started really getting involved in crime? See, what you've got to understand, my dad was a criminal, and his father was a criminal. Now, in certain lifestyles, or occupations, that might be a hazard. To me, I hit the road run, you know, and it was an education. As I say, from six years of age, I've been around people all my life, my travelling com- the travelling community, my family, uh, the West End, Barry Boys, and professional criminals from a very early age, you know. So I was never gonna be a dentist. <laughs> <laughs> still get time, Stephen. <laughs> you still get time. Aye. So life then between the ages are when you get out from a detention from sixteen to twenty one, what was that? period of your life like well I did vote in my life to gun fever to be honest you know I thought this is my career this is a life I, this is a life I chose I got nine month youth custody for burglar in a cash and carry when I was 18 um, I came out of there went back into crime again and on the tw- on my 22nd birthday 12 August 1987 a group of men went away and robbed Sullivan's main sorting of us at three quarters of a million pound the police went and raided my mum's, looking for me and my brother. I wasn't there. The rest of my brother, John, he spent a year on remand. A police officer came through on an identification period and says, it was not John, but it looks like it resembles him. But she was the one who was going to fit me up, so I spent a year on the run. Them days, it was a big thing. I had to leave the country, you know, take the trip abroad, as I say. And I'd done that, you know. And mm-hmm. I uh, spent a bit of time in Spain. I spent a bit of time in Tenerife, you know. It was, it was all interesting times, you know. So when you were thieving, what kind of stuff, what turns were you doing? Well, I could, no, I'll tell you what I got arrested for, not what I got away with. <laughs> <laughs> put the cameras on for that one. I'll be defeating the object, buddy, lad. I was scrubbing cash and carries or not. I mm-hmm. cash and carries, taking whatever I could, cigarettes, cigarettes, high-value stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew what to steal and what not to steal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there yeah. we go. Right. Your brothers as well have got the fearsome reputation. Right. Um, one of them, somebody put a hat out in your life. Went into a pub, I and they've I, I this they got the wrong one. They got the wrong brother, and the cousin was shot as well. well I'm the wrong brother, like I'm all right, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Need to suspect the brother. <laughs> but eh, uh, my brother got shot five times. He got me. My brother got shot five times, and my cousin got mistaken by me and shot six times. And I'll see it. And I'll see it again, you know. Well, better him than me, you know. <laughs> Need to suspect the man. Well, I've got any desires to be shot of anybody. <laughs> How was that then, knowing that you had a hit out in your life? <laughs> didn't bother the slaves. I got arrested really later. I did for uh, this is allegedly killed the person who um, who shot Michael. You know, this year they accused us. I got arrested three or four times for the man was thrown out a block of flats window with nine floors up. You know, um, this year the connection was because he shot Michael through the window, asked long with the window, which was a lot of bollocks, really. Mm. You know, so the boy who shot your brother's dead, mm, supposed to be. There you go. I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, also. You did a big sentence as well. I don't know. Over ten years. Got a ten eye. How was that experience? Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I started off. I spent fifteen months in, in the block. I was a double category a prisoner. Me and me make were double category at the time. Um, it was about when when the Irish left the country. There was only about ten double category a prisoners, and there was three triple category a. John was triple category a, and me and make were double category a. You know, um, <clears throat> ten year sentence. We're doing thirty seven year between the three were. Was no rehabilitation there whatsoever for what you know. We all got released from a dispersal prison as category A prisoners. And life's life, you know, life goes on. What can you do? You know, you meet a bed, you line it. The guidelines for me crime was two to three years. I received a 10. I received a 10, you know. So. Is that because of the name? Yes, it is. Yes, yes. You were in with some serious people as well. Paul Ferris, for one, from Glasgow. Oh, Paul, yeah. Paul, right, um, right. Charlie Cray. Yeah, right. How was it like being in with them? Yeah. I found Paul a very interesting person. And to be honest, I f- I'm going to be honest, I found Charlie, old Charlie a soulful figure in prison. An old man in prison doesn't belong there like that, you know. Charlie told us, he says, I came back from work one day, and the school says, Steam is a celebrity, said, you're doing waiting to see you. 
So when I get to, I see how Charlie's would send me do. She's Stephen, I'd like to meet you. I'd like to uh, talk to you about um. Sorry, I'd, like to, I'd like to talk to you about um what's happening. She's me. Your name's been repeatedly mentioned all from me courtiers. So he told her, she says, what happened? He says, I made a meeting, she says, to go and see two people in a pub. He says, between me, he's dead, no second speak one. He says, between me and you, he says, we're gonna, I was going to send him a couple of kilos of Charlie. I says, all right. He says, so when I get there, he says, to my surprise, he says, like, he says, please, first of all, the place was bouncing. The old Saints had just getting a record contract. He says, the Spice Girls were there and them getting the number one. They had no connection at all of what Charlie was up to, you know. He says, and two, two people come in the bar. He says, to my surprise, there were two Geordies. He says, so the atmosphere changed. He says, I suppose for a little bit, about 30 seconds. He says, and I looked at him and he says, do you know the Sears brothers? And the two, he says, I'll never get the look on the face. They looked at each other very sheepishly and went, yes, we know them. He says, could you pass a message and tell them old Charlie's asking after them? He says, so that's how your case, your name got mentioned with a friend of mine who later got assassinated, who I used to look after, not under my watch when he got assassinated, by the way. Uh, that was Peter Golan. Now, he, he was connected with Charlie. So uh, that's how my name came about, you know. But mm. um, yes, yes, I met them in that. Yeah, your name's known all up and down the country as well, mm. same as Paul and... I speak, he speaks very highly of you. Vice versa. Yeah, so, yeah. I but you've, you've, you're friends with some interesting characters as well. Big Brian Cockrell, who we had big on Brian's me big pal, the man. podcast big a couple man. of weeks ago, The Tax Man. Ah, How did that relationship come about? Well, it came about from a good friend of mine, called, a man called Lee Duffy. Lee Duffy was a fighting man from Teesside. He phoned us up one day, he says, Stephen, he says, I want you to re- re- meet my friend. He says, I've just had the hardest fight with the strongest man I've ever met in my life. You know, for a man for Lee Duffy to say that, this case has got to be special. So lo and behold, what happens, we made a meet, I goes through, and Lee and uh, Brian comes and sees us, we goes to a, re- we goes to a restaurant for uh, Sunderland, has a bite to eat, uh, stays a few hours longer and we had a little bit tanked up. Uh, came outside and um, was a football game going on? Well, it had been a football game, it was a Saturday night, you know. Them two just fucked up upon themselves and knocked about a half a dozen people with that heat. That's what he did, he said, the men football. <laughs> yeah, Brian's a good big guy, Brian's man. Brian's a diamond, yeah. a diamond. And on his dear, I'll say one thing, on his dear, that man would have probably been one of the best men in the castle on the cobbles. Uh, England, on the cobbles, you know? Yeah, using his hands. Oh, the arms are normally strong. You've got to bear in mind, the man's benching, he's squatting legs of 700 pounds. You know, he's one of the strongest, one of the most strongest men in Britain. And he, he, he's got his ability to box as well. So it's pretty key. It's a very mm. dangerous combination when you, put, when you put a little bit of bad intentions in there yeah. as well. So Lee Duffy, the story of Lee Duffy, I keep hearing his name getting through about left, right and centre. How tough was this man? Man underneath, yeah. yeah. Man underneath, yeah, you know. I would describe the person, like, it looked like Dolph Lundgren. Six foot three. One little story. He was in jail. He was in Ackleton prison. He's telling his team that. He says, he was walking along. School tell me. He says, walking along. He says, he says, he walks up the school. He never had a, he's like, that's search. He said, look for a snout, never had a snout. And took the screw, took the tab at the school's move. The school says, what are you doing? He says, I've taken the tabs of you. He looked in his box, there was only three tabs. He says, no, gun it side, and gun there's 20 tabs. If you don't, I'm going to knock you out. The school went and got the tabs from him. <laughs> well, that was from uh, Lee Tellers, that story. And so did another school tell us that story. They were terrified. He had an the other man, you know. And he was murdered, though. He did, I. He got stabbed in the back. It's not exactly Victoria Cross material, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Too scared to maybe face him because obviously he was handy with his hands. Too handy. Too yeah. Handy, you know? So, Big Brian, then, how are you now? Best of pads, always will be. Yeah. I said to him one day, I said, Brian, I know you're a strong laddie. How strong are you? He says, Steve, just move one set of sentence. He got behind the car. He lifted the <laughs> car up and slung it about five foot one direction. You know this, I'm not about moving it a little bit. He done this to six or seven cars. <laughs> no, I'm Ben Ranger. I'm looking at these cars. These cars are starting. You know, the first thing that we I thought, this is abnormal. This is abnormal. <laughs> I like you, man. I've got a lot of time. Oh, for that. I speak highly of him. Yeah. Me you were also, when you done your over your 10 year sentence, you were in the segregation unit for over two years? A 15 month I spent in the segregation yeah. one sitting. How was that? Educational. Yeah. Good bit of counter building. Now, what, like I say, I didn't know if I could say I prepared us for any segregation unit in any way, shape, or form. But you've read me, you've read me book, you know. Um, my father had it. When we're, when we're younger, you know, as I say, he worked for the breweries. He had he he was violent when he was drunk. He's not getting away from it, you know. He battered her and how he went the dog kennel. So uh, you know, maybe an upbringing of so uh, spent fifteen months in the segregation unit. I suppose in a connection with the dog kennel had something. Yeah, maybe he's had a good food a lot, you know. So just dubbed up in a room yourself with nothing. Mm-hmm. Need windows in the cell, need windows, need heating, snow coming through, you know. Absolutely freezing cold conditions, you know. That loony bin. 
Who was in there with you? Me brother Michael. Me brother Michael, you know. Did you get to speak to each other? You? Well, one of the unit, we're a couple of different parts of the unit all the time, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, different units, they like, say, up and down the country, you know. Many prisons have you been in, Stephen? Ah, oh, different count, man. Different count. <laughs> too many. Far too many. <laughs> <laughs> What's the story with the million pound and the suitcase? Huh? As I say, me father had various occupations when we were younger, you know. We were streetwise at a very early age, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I suppose in a, in a sense we're prepared and it'd be in life to be what the occupation we took. So anyway, we get a phone call. My dad's running about with his pal. We knew he was up to no good. So the phone call says, was that his uncle's been, my uncle's been arrested and they're going to come arrest my dad and they'll come search the house. Well, we knew my dad wouldn't have anything in the house. Now, them big old-fashioned houses when you used to have two sitting rooms and they'd knock the wall, do you make a kitchen into one mm-hmm. and the glass doors. One of them, there was a torn suitcase there. So, uh, when my mother says, she was searched those, we knew one fellow wouldn't have known So, she says, we'll open the suitcase. I'll never get I got the suitcase. I, went out, I clicked it like that. I see them on the telly, and they want to raise it forward. Oh, fuck. It was full, full of money. It was a million pounds in it. Shit. No, about only a year, six, seven eight years of age or something, you know? So, well, I had enough sense to realise that, that the police are going to come get this forced, and my father's going to be in trouble. So, we immediately put it in a uh, big old rucksack, a big old army bag, made me brother John. And we we'll hit up the 70, I'll say, well, 70, which is just at the top of my mother's street, you know? So we're hidden there. We're hidden doing a grave, and we stayed with it for like two or three days until my father got released from the police station. Naturally, you know, as, I'll never forget, you know, I mean, more John, before, well, clever, was no cigar. We took one of the bells, I don't know, what was $20 bill at the table, and lit it. Before, <laughs> 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 well, clever. Before, well, half your fool, we better put it back, you know? And we're hiding the two bob, and everything went, well, I've got more than a million quid. I didn't know much was there, I knew there was a lot, you know. Mm. But it was, uh, and I says, my dad, I says, I was looking for a few quid for doing what I'd done, you know, I expect to get a drink. He says, your reward is in your experience. <laughs> no, <that> was, <laughs> and that was it, uh-huh. you know. Because your dad was a very tough man. Ah, he was. A really man. tough. Your old boy was shot in the head as well. He did, I. he did, I. It was, uh, he drove himself to the hospital, is that correct? That is correct, I. The man tried to assassinate him, um, the man that came forward and says he had hacked into uh, the national computer and says he could find files on it to prove that my brother had been fitting up. My brother John was doing 15 years for the uh, security van robbery at the time. And there was evidence there that John had been fitted up, you know. So he was bringing, he was, he was feeding him slowly, you know, but little bits of, little bits of paperwork here, paperwork there. And he made a meet to see him on the case side. First, he says, I was looking at the paperwork and I looked up and he put the gun to his head like that. And my father twirled one side, fired, went through his jaw, then jammed in the other side strong old man he pulls him forward pulls the man's face box against the, the car bangs his hand against a few things breaks it in the vehicle fortunately there was an automatic gun the bullets jaw jammed somewhere along the line and he pulled back and he tried to shoot me father again before I drove away in his car and went to the hospital when I gets to the hospital I get a phone call I arrives at the hospital <clears throat> when I get there the car's outside it's covered in blood and he's, he's there and he's semi-conscious and believe it or not the man who's actually done it on the phone see and, see, and special branch had made him do it Please, please, please give us forgiveness. Now I thought, this man is not going to stop now. No, I'm going to either get myself killed or he's going to kill another one of my family, and you now he's going to try and kill. So I thought, I've got one chance and one chance only. So instead of playing the nasty card, I played the sweet and innocent card, and I'm terrified for my dad's safety. He half stood for it. I says, that. He says Where can I see? He says, The Leaser's Park. But it's going to be dark now, you know. So I thought, Oh well. And I thought, right, this man's got a gun. He's just trying to kill me father. Naturally, if he sees me in the park, he knows, he knows I'm a danger. He's going to try and kill me. West End was full of variety of different criminals at the time. And it wasn't very hot to go and get two or three people tooled up, which I did. So within a half an hour, I've got a car full of people. Then we've went and made the way to the laser's park and tell us where, where to go. She said, make your way around there. He says, we'll be, we'll be there. He says, if the man's going to approach you, that'll be the man who does it. So anyway, I'm walking around the, I'm walking around the lake, the... the as I'm walking around it, I see this man looking us very funny. He's got a big coat, a big pocket coat on. You know, <laughs> when you walk to somebody and you think the man's going to shoot you, it's yeah. a nice thing to experience, you know. So stand next to the bushes and he comes closer and closer and he has click, clicks. And I, I, knew the boys, I knew the boys were in the bushes. I knew the boys were in the bushes, but it was just a normal student asking for a light. I thought, you've got no idea how close you are. <laughs> <laughs> hey, did I? Shit, man. Hey, 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 come close to the laddie. <laughs> Fuck him. Fucking yeah, hell. And so from there, the man went to the police station, handed himself in, explained what he had done and wanted for his own safety. 
They put the man on remand. Lo and behold, I end up on remand. Put us downstairs to him. So for the day, he decided to mouth off and how, how what he had done and how proud he was and all that. So uh, the screw system, I've had enough for this. How come with me? Took us upstairs, opened the screw's door, opened the screw with the door. He started screaming, this Bob Stoker on the other side door, please don't let him in yet, don't let him in. I said, let me for two minutes. He says, carry on annoying him and I'm going to let him in your cell. So uh, the man, the man shut up after that. He went to court and he came up in court that the man had been a police informer for a number of years and had been so good that no one from your police didn't know what to do with him. They give him a sentence of four years for shooting my father in the heat. Oh, sick. Yeah. So he was working with the corpus? Ah, he was. Ah, he went doing the... They moved him doing the, some jail, doing the, doing the road, doing Plymouth, doing that way, you know. Um, lo and behold, one of my friends was there from Manchester. He put a hundred odd stitches in his face for badness, you know. Was there any truth... it wasn't his juggler yeah. fucking vein. <laughs> was there any truth to the police that told me to shoot your dad? You never know, yeah. You never know. Well, especially once he's done it, you know. You never know. That's fucking scary. Yeah, of course it is. So obviously the reputation that you've got and taking your dad out off the cards is a, is a big mass for anybody to try and move up the ranks, mm -hmm. including yourselves as well. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a time you did, this is just fucking nuts, I'm out? I you, eventually had to say how the toll in, you know what I mean? I didn't I didn't come second to anybody and get beat or, or rule over or anything like that. You know, if I retired, I retired at the top. Mm -hmm. They taught me profession, that's what I'd done. I just said, enough's enough. To be honest, why it's why it happened I was wanting to see my mum. I mean, my mum was saying, mean, she's my Stephen, look at please, enough's enough. How are you can turn your life around? It's easy. Actually, people don't realise it. it's actually easier being a businessman than it's being a criminal. Yeah. The phone's on as bad, you can always get a few quid again, you kinda get your you kinda get your freedom back. Yeah, your time. You escape, like. <laughs> <laughs> your time, yeah. That's Aye. a million percent correct, Stephen. And Listen, man, it's great to see you changing your life, writing your book, and I know you're going to write a second book, Aye. and maybe documentaries and films, because your story's unbelievable. And mm. you've not really well, told let me put it. there, you know. Yeah, me Stephen says, lads yeah, no, we'll get that, we'll get all the links on the bio anyway, um, for the book, because it's a great read, some fucking fascinating stories, because your brother as well was involved, or allegedly involved, I don't know if he's been charged, with the one of the biggest robberies in the post office of all time, is that correct? What happened was, when I was younger... Um, on my 22nd birthday, 1987, or 12 August 1987, there was a robbery committed from Sunderland Sorting Office. It happened to be Britain's biggest post office robbery, three quarters of a million pounds was stolen. The police went to me mum's looking for me, me and my brother John. I wasn't there, the rest of my brother John. On an identity, identity period, one, a police woman came forward and said, that is not the man, but he really resembles him. That was a woman who was going to pick me out and verbal me up and fit us up. So I spent a year in the run at the time. For, it was, you know, it was a big thing. You know, in the 80s, if you've got to go and leave the country, you know, to take the trip abroad, as you would say, you know, you only ever heard it on the TV. And that's what I had to do, you know. I spent a, I spent a year on the run. Um, I lived in Spain, Tenerife. I lived up in Scotland. I stayed up there on a boat. Don't fucking bring in trouble to our country, Stephen. Ah, yeah. <laughs> I went and see my neighbours, you know. Right, <laughs> right. Typical fucking Geordies are always causing trouble somewhere. <laughs> what was it like being on the run for a, for a year? What was that like? Well, it was interesting, you know. Like, uh, I supported my life by fever when I was away, you know. It was just a big adventure to me, you know. I was crazy young lad, you need fever, no, you know. Mm -hmm. It was a big adventure. Was that a buzz for you? It was a bigger buzz getting when I found my brother had been found not guilty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I was sitting in the house. I was sitting in the house in a flat. I hadn't left the flat for three months. And I was listening to Radio 1. And the news flash came on Radio 1. That two men had been acquitted for Britain's biggest post office robbery. Just hmm. uh, see, I was a little bit happy. I was in honesty. I was sitting during the time. I jumped up in the air. I remember I got to hit the ceiling. I was fit like at the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's what happened, yeah. So... Uh, I said, poor as the cat was out the bag, and, and they, being a criminal, yeah, it's an interesting life. Being a high profile criminal, going away fever, and you kind of do it. You kind of do it defeat yeah. the object. So the cat was out the bag in a sense, you know. So the days of thieving had to go unwinding. Because that's when your reputation in the Sayers family tenfold, because obviously the news, UK wide, with that robbery. Yeah, yeah. Everybody that, that, knew that, that, who you were then. Things made a name up here, you know. Yeah. Is the police been after you? Since then, just non stop, constantly hassle. Constantly. I was still, I put it on my Facebook account the other week, you know. It was strange. I was sitting in bed watching a bit on a Saturday afternoon and Saturday morning, you know, watching a bit of Tom. I'll keep it for the neat time, you know. There's times and places, James, that you know. Times and places, buddy, that one away. See, anyway, he has a noise inside my door. 
this is two years, must have put with a lamp post. He's only put a hidden camera on the top of my lamp post in the back and front. I'm looking, that's what's the fucking noise they made, you know. I thought this is very unprofessional. It's typical law from the police, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, climbed up, had a look at it, it's a four way camera. Just left it there. Left it every every lane, come every street leading off me from where my house is. It's got one. You couldn't drive on this drive on me street now without being ca captured on camera, you know. Yeah. This never stops. So I'll go to restaurants, they'll go there and the last of the can bug it up. So uh, I'm not an active criminal anymore, it doesn't it doesn't bother us, but Jesus Christ, these people all touch they couldn't no. catch a cold half of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's the inconvenience though that if you're trying to get everything together, try to do good in life and speak the truth and Try and help others who's watching us maybe want to get involved in crime and go, look, I say ain't a fucking life. It's not a life. It's you know what life. I mean? See, no, from the police hate us the worst because, not because we're the worst, it's because we won't bout them. We'll not give them any money, any information. And they don't like it. Yeah. What a fucking shame. Because <laughs> <laughs> you were good pals with Paddy Conroy. Paddy Conroy. Yeah. Piss on him. So how's that? how did that relationship come about? I was good friends with his brother Michael. Michael was a good yeah. decent lad. The Paddy one's just a long tail. Yeah. What Paddy Conroy done was use a thing tactic called deflectionary tactics. Mm -hmm. For over 20 years, this man called everybody and the dog a police informer. Simple reason, to deflect attention away from his low life activities. It got so bad in Newcastle that he called so many people that when you're a police informer and you want to deflect attention away from yourself by calling an innocent person a grass, right? it is commonly known in Newcastle that was doing a Paddy Conroy, or the short version, he's doing a Conroy. <laughs> Every city's got one. Every city's got one. We've got this long tail. <laughs> um, Viv Graham. So you haven't finished with him. He got us arrested. He got us arrested. He made a five-page statement against us. Got us arrested, charged, and convicted for malicious communication. I was the second, second, only second person that couldn't be charged for calling him on Facebook. Oh, he's hurt his feelings. What a shame. Truth hurts. The truth can be a very dangerous weapon. And he does not like the truth. Fuck's oh, sick. Right. So, now writing your book, because we spoke earlier and you said you couldn't write. No, I couldn't. I couldn't write until I was 30, read or write. And you've wrote this book... I've never read a book. I've never read a book, but I wrote that one. So how, what made you, what gave for you the idea, the inspiration to write your book? We got past Steve Riff. See, Steve, Steve hey boy. You want Steve and lad? Yeah. That's 30 good years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're getting Steve on after yourself. Aye. Steve, very well respected in the underworld as well. Yes, I The Craze, Ferris, Highly respected by yourself. all family and other people in the yeah. country, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Steve gives the idea to do it. My daughter, Rebecca, helped us. She, I tell her she wrote it down, you know. Um, as I say, I've never, I've never read a book before in my life. To, to write a book is a very strange thing. I've still never read that. It's never really interested to read it, you know. How was it for you going through it, though? Did it bring back a lot of emotions? Because there's a lot of hard-hitting stories in there. The hardest story you had to write was the first, well, was the first chapter, you know, and I kept that to last. Because it was very emotional, you know, going through them time period, you know, of sitting, getting battered and having the dogs killing when you were a child. It's not a nice thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I suppose when like say, and I relate a lot of that fifteen months I spent in the segregation unit. I don't know if like say it would have been different if I hadn't done that experience in the dog kennel. But uh it prepared us, I suppose, in a sense, you know. Mm -hmm. mm. But didn't weaken. Yeah, uh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Obviously a lot of people don't understand that life of crime or whatever it is, but if you're involved in it, if you're already doing it from the ages of four, five, six, it's already ingrained in you. Do you know what I mean? So it's difficult. For anybody to get out that that life, for anybody watching, it's maybe try to get involved in that life. I think it's cool because I used to watch all the films and go, "That's cool as fuck." But then when you start seeing the misery and the pain, <coughs> the other people it causes, it's it's heartbreaking and you're getting trauma through it, PTSD, and it fucks with your mind. For anybody watching, what advice would you give for them? That's maybe at the crossroads. There's two bits of advice I could give them. Yeah, there's no criminal could say first what could be them get caught. Common sense was like you know I mean? <laughs> But on the other hand, you know, when you're sitting, I've done a 10 year, as I, you know, I've done a 10 year sentence, I was double category a prisoner. And my little boy came on a visit with his little pal, and he went pointers, he went, Look, I've got a dad, there's my dad there, you know. Hey, it's hurt you, you know, it hurts. Mm -hmm. It hurts, you know. And the regret is the children, you know, I would have had more children. I would have had to spend more time with my children. This is priceless. It's all glamorous, you know, it looks, it looks well, you know, on the eye, oh, look at this, look at this, look at the respect they get, look at the birds, birds fling themselves at them, you know, and different things, you know, money comes left, right, you know. But it's, as I say, it's, it's an easier life being a businessman than it is being a criminal. And the rewards are better you didn't lose. Yeah. Liberty and that, you know. 
Yeah, it's the most valuable currency, I believe, is your time, your freedom. Aye. You can get more done. But again, if you're involved in it, you're a product of your environment where you think it's normal, mm -hmm. on the run, robberies, whatever the fuck it is you're mm -hmm. doing, it becomes a norm. And it's scary that people accept that life and mm -hmm. they get caught up in that. But you're out at Oh, it's all gone. Free. It's all gone. Um, we're I'll working on, you're trying to get a second book. Can we talk about that, Steve? Yeah. Yeah. The second book, which obviously Steve's behind again. So what's the plans for that? Well, that's, the plans are we're going to get it out at the same time. We've got a film coming out next year. Uh, try and test is going to be made into a film. I've got a good double BAFTA winner, um, Gary, Gary Fraser from Scotland. Scottish boy was in, uh, um, yeah, I, I speak to him on Instagram. It was on, was it Trainspotting? What was he involved yeah, in? Trainspotting, Wales yeah. and Wales. Yeah, that's right, correct, man, yeah. Ah, yeah. He's a good man. We've done my yeah. homework on the lad when we heard him came, he was interested. His other ones came interested, but he's the one who ticks all the boxes mm -hmm. full of confidence for the lad, and we believe he's going to do it right for me, you know. Yeah, are you excited for it? I am, as well as I. It'll be strange, you know. But that's stuff, I'm going to give some of the proceeds to, like, say, to charities, you know. Mm -hmm. You've got to do a little bit, you know. You can't, mm -hmm. it's, I can't expect to go and sit there and, like, say, in a sense, it's, it's like getting a living out of crime in a way, you know. So, therefore, like, say, the victims of crime is going to benefit from this. Yeah. Which is a good thing, man, because I think as much as you bring the big names on and we can talk about the crime and the robberies, there is victims in that as well. Do you know what I mean? It's a pe yeah, it's those people who hurt and who have the trauma as well. And I know we laugh and we joke, but you've got to, we've got to fucking laugh as well. But there is victims, or there's always victims, and no matter what it is in life. Of course it is, man. Of course it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, would you ever do talks of that at schools? Aye, wouldn't I? See, like what you're saying there, tough guys will always come and go, but the victims are always remaining the same. Yeah. You know, it always, it always happen. I'd like to think I could go into prisons at some stage, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I've talked with Paul Ferris, Paul's interested. Brian Cottle's interested. Different different people up and down the country, you know. Mm -hmm. I believe I could go into prison and talk to them. you've custody, you know, and talk some sense them. You would bring a footballer to educate a young footballer. You'd bring a musician to educate a young musician. They're those and those. Why can't you have a criminal? What's yeah. the moral? Nah. Go down prisons, schools. Why aye, man? Why yeah. aye? Why aye, man? Why aye? <laughs> <laughs> so what's a day, day like for you now, just on a daily basis? Uh, not much. It's quiet. Just a quiet life, no man, just a quiet life. Mm -hmm. um, Do you go to the games, Newcastle games? I used to have patriotic Jody and that's what I was, you know. I might come with a retirement for my gosh, you know, which we fix I can't. We don't sense we're doing anymore. Uh -huh. <laughs> It's a great, I love it down here. It's fucking nuts. When I was drinking, no, I'm not drinking anymore, but it was wild. Good times down here, man. Yeah. You can always spot a Geordie last in the middle mm -hmm. of the winter. She's the one who doesn't wear the coat. Her knickers. <laughs> <laughs> no, what wear the coat? No, no, no. <laughs> <too much>. <laughs> <laughs> you get yourself doing the big walk to see if things like that. You'll have a fight on your hands. <laughs> no, it's a great place down here. I fucking love it, man. It's a great place, great vibes. It's like Glasgow. You've got Liverpool... Newcastle, Glasgow's a kind See, of similar. You Scottish are forced you've had us with Geordie's here because we've taught us how to speak English. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're still struggling. <laughs> Both of us, I think. <laughs> <laughs> People like that, we need fucking subtitles for this. So, the new book coming out, mm -hmm. film possibly. What about documentary? We're doing a documentary, I think. There's one planned. There's one in the pipeline, you know. Mm -hmm. While you were in prison as well, who was. Did you ever look at anybody and go, he's a right tough bastard? He's fucking tough did you ever respect you've got to respect people yeah, but yeah I mean, it's certainly like a mutual thing you know but yeah was that ever all anybody oh, yeah fuck nah <laughs> <laughs> fuck don't need all of somebody more <laughs> I, I was I when I was a kid um, super mark yeah uh, Alan Shearer that's about Shira, it Shearer man he's I'll tell you I'm a patriotic Jory mm -hmm. uh, I like Shearer man what a player he was who oh, doesn't yeah so forward for the future we've got everything coming out everything's good with yourself how many kids you got? Declared, I got. <laughs> <laughs> I was walking through Auckland jail on exercise one day, and a laddie came up to us and he says, Stephen, he says, I was talking to your son the other day. I says, which one? He says, William. I says, who the fuck is William? <laughs> <laughs> he, says, he says, you've got a better guess I called. Well, I says, not that to my knowledge, my, not to my knowledge. A lot of people say that you're a uncle or cousin or right. father. Mothers, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who knows what you're doing your spare time yeah, now, Stephen? All right, three hours. I'm not as busy as I used to be years ago. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I've settled down now, you know. I've got myself a good last quiet down. And believe it or not, I'm not even a fucking who I'm most anymore. Good. Yeah, I, Do you think that's what makes people change as well when they meet someone? Well, the last who I met, she had a large burn on my life, you know. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we love relationship finished for whatever food prison basically, you know. <laughs> but um, the last thing we have now, yes, I've got a lot of respect for her. She's got a lot for me, and, and it's just what I needed in life, you know. I suppose. Yeah, about a bit of balance. Yeah, uh, yes, 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 good lass. So how's the family and stuff now? Yeah, everybody's alright, you know. Yeah, everybody's alright, you know. We're all trying, trying to get a straight living. It's difficult, you know, when you've got these people around you constantly. Mm-hmm. Um, Constantly grief from the police. That will never stop. Well, on me kids as well. You know, it's a simple case. If you hit the cat, hit the kittens. You know, they give me kid, they give me children grief. Me, there was a shooting of an incident around the corner there, a nightclub, and um, what had happened was a bit. The doorman had beat me children up, build a, beat the bends up. Me son went back. He's an ex ex boxer, Royal Marine, and had a straight over one of the doorman, big giant thing. Me boy punched the fuck at him. Um, and what happened was the boys went doing the only young ones, you know, the kids. And the fucking the dome and attacked them, said with them. Mm-hmm. Um there was a shooting, one of them got shot. And people that got people that got arrested, you know. Arrested and found out guilty on it. Yeah. So you, the kids are still getting hassled as well because of the name? Yes, as I see it. Yeah. The How many the in the family kids. was there? In my family, yeah. just me and me two brothers. Yeah. Was that? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So how the fuck is, uh, so people make out as if he's a massive, massive family, 50, 60. No, is that not correct, no? There's a lot of them. Aye. We represented the West End of Newcastle, I suppose we were the figureheads of the West End. Yeah. Right? So any, a lot of like, so people attach any crimes what happened in the West End, don't they say, this year, this year, this year. Mm-hmm. And the majority of the time, 99% of the time, don't know, there's nothing to do with you, you know? Did you get ripped in for a lot of stuff that you, you well, well, everything, yeah. <laughs> that you never did, that people just threw your name in? It happens, you know. But when you're an active criminal, you're not, you're not bothered, you know. Like I was what I was, you know. I was, you know, they like, say, uh, I'm not ashamed of it in any way, shape, or form, you know. Mm-hmm. I've got respect. I can get anywhere in the country and I've got respect, you know. Do you, how do you, when you think about the past, even telling your story now, how does it, does it bring back a lot of emotion? Do you speak about it a lot? Because you've never really did interviews, you've never really, you've never really spoken before. Why is that? Because I was brought up to be. Silent. No profile, no profile, no tattoos on us, not a, not a, mm-hmm. you know, seen as with designer suit and all that, you know, just a blender, you know, and that's which we always brought up, you know, being, being, when I was a criminal, I had, a, I had other criminals advising us, you know, from an early age, and running about in big flash cars, it was no good to you. Yeah. Uh, these young drug dealers, these young criminals, no ideas, are they? Yeah. Half of them will piss themselves if you showed them a bit of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Listen, the amount of snitches and people that are involved nowadays is unbelievable, especially the young kids with the fake Rolexes, the least cars, Sitting with the blue light on top of it, making fucking. Of course, fuck it. of course. You know the I mean? Newcastle, no Newcastle. Newcastle. One time the criminals controlled Newcastle. They call them PGs now with Newcastle. Police gangsters. What they do is they'll be handling some drug dealer. The drug dealer will get a, they'll raid the drug dealer, find him with a kilo of cocaine. Maybe it's 20 grand. The kid goes to the court, he's up, for, he's up for two ounces of cocaine at two grand. The busies have done him a favour. They work him that way. I hear these stories. And before you know, the busies handling him, getting the wage of him, eliminating his competition. Yeah, I would say, I would describe no from the police as the most corrupt police force in the country, by far. Yeah, you spoke about that earlier, that there's a lot of corruption here in Newcastle. Aye. Really aye. bad. Aye. Aye. You know, who's going to complain and say, listen, you've raided me, who's your fund of keto cocaine? You've only declared two. I should have a 12-year sentence instead of a two-year sentence. Who's going to do that? They're not, are they? Mm-hmm. They know what you to handle it. It's, it's a license to commit crime. That's what they call them, PGs. There's a bar in the Jasmine area, Osborne Road. That's where the police drink. So you've got up there, you've got, you've got police officers stand with, with words with designer clothing on, mistresses, most of them, and they've got wads of money, maybe a grand in their pocket. You know, and our criminals and drug dealers, they'll have a wad of money, or footballers, but a police officer. You know, I'm just going to go for a drink, I'll just never get a, get a grand at the cash point. <laughs> 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 no, it doesn't have one. These kids are, these people are right in their legs, they're dishonest to the bone. Mm-hmm. Just goes to show about that, Right. Is there anything you'd like to touch on? Viv Graham, because you, you did ask him, but he was finishing up on Conroy. You asked him about Viv Oh, so Viv Graham. Aye, aye, Viv was my pal. But didn't start off as pals. But you could see if Viv Graham represented the doorman in Newcastle, mm. and the Sears family represented the West End and the villains in Newcastle, yeah. Um, there was a lot of trouble, vice versa. When the pals we ended up getting, what happened was I asked him one day, he said something, some doorman had passed the message Sears that the Sears family aren't allowed at a nightclub. Yeah, in the 80s and 90s, you know, that was definitely going to be trouble if you could come up with all stupid, stupid things like that. So anyway, he takes Viv up to the nightclub. He bashed the granny at the geezer. With a little bit of assistance of three or four as well, you know. Good old-fashioned West End beating. Um, got nicked for it. 
was a police officer in the, in the, in the undercover police officer in the, in the club at the time. He portrayed himself as a hero, but the video showed that he was a coward and he ran in the corner and he'd never seen a fucking thing. Yeah. But anyway, cut long story short, the fight's actually on. It's who it was in the club, it's on YouTube. Um, Viv received a sentence of 18 months. I received a sentence of two and a half years for watching their fight, you know, nice of them, you know. So you get a bigger sentence for just being there? Aye, aye, aye. And this is on YouTube? What's the name on YouTube? It'll be Fifth Graham, Fifth Graham, whoever's nightclub, it shows you. Fifth know. Graham, so the video's there, check it out. We'll put the link in the description box. We'll put the links to um, Stephen's book um, and his Facebook pages, stuff like that, because we've got, he's hoping to do a documentary, the film this year, the second book, so we'll put every link down there. But yeah, anything else? Great today, but for how, coming on today, Stephen. Ah, listen, brother, and um, listen, and hearing your story, you're a good guy, man. And hopefully, we can do something in the future. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. yeah no, it's Anytime. been a yeah. It's thank been you. Pleasure. Cheers, brother. Thank you very much. Thank you.